The circumstances recorded in the following narrative are stated to have really happened. They are of so horrible a stamp that, for the honour of human nature, every reader must wish them to be fictitious. They are given in the form of a letter, the name of the writer of which is indicated only by the initial M. Yesterday thus wrote M to one of his friends, Yesterday the pretty Mademoiselle Vildac was married to the amiable Sanville. As a neighbour I was invited to the festivities given on the occasion, but the merriment of the day was succeeded, as far as I was concerned, by a night of such horror as my pen can but faintly describe. You know old Vildac, whose unlucky physiognomy was always so repulsive to us, and whom we were in consequence afraid to trust. I watched him narrowly yesterday, and fully expected that the joyous occasion of the marriage of his only daughter would relax his morose muscles and plant a smile of satisfaction on his scowling visage. I was mistaken. Instead of taking a paternal interest in the tender emotion of his child and the rapture of his son-in-law, he seemed, on the contrary, to be displeased with the joy expressed in our faces, and this unnatural father had well nigh spoiled by his detestable temper all the pleasures of the day, both for his children and his guests. When bedtime arrived, I was shown, for want of a more commodious lodging, into a room in the great tower of the castle. Scarcely had I closed my eyes before I was roused by a dull noise, as I thought, overhead. I listened and distinctly heard the rattling of chains and the sound of footsteps slowly descending the stairs. All at once my door flew open. A spectre entered dragging along the chains which clanked frightfully, went up to the fireplace, stirred the fire, and pushed together some half-extinguished brands. A hollow voice pronounced the words, "'Tis a long time since I warmed myself." I confess, my friend, for why should I deny it, that I was thrilled with horror. I seized my sword to defend myself in case of emergency, and softly drew aside the curtains of the bed. By the glimmer of the fire I perceived the emaciated figure of what appeared to be a venerable old man, half naked, with bald head and a snow-white beard. He was holding his hands, shivering with cold to the fire. I was deeply moved. While I was thus surveying him, a flame now and then flickered from the embers. He looked thoughtfully towards the door by which he had entered, and then fixed his eyes steadfastly on the floor. He seemed to be absorbed in the profoundest grief, and traces of long misery were deeply imprinted upon his furrowed face. In a few minutes he sunk, as if involuntarily, on his tottering knees. He seemed to pray. The only words I could understand were, O oh God, O oh God, how just are thy judgments. I now purposefully made some noise with my curtains. Is anybody here? asked he. Is anybody in this bed? Yes, said I, completely undrawing my curtains. But who are you, old man? He sighed and motioned with his hand, as if to signify that he was unable to speak for weeping. At length he became rather more composed. I am the most wretched creature on the face of the earth, said he. I ought perhaps to tell you no more, but it is so many years since I have beheld human beings that joy at the sight of one of my fellow creatures hurries me away in spite of myself. Take compassion on me. My sufferings will perhaps seem less severe when I have related them to you. The terror which I had at first experienced now gave place to pity. I put on my morning gown and took a seat beside him. He seemed affected by this proof of my confidence, seized my hand and bedewed it with his tears. Good man, said he, first satisfy my curiosity and tell me why you have tonight taken up your abode in this odious apartment which is usually unoccupied. What was that extraordinary rattling of carriages which I heard this morning about the castle? Something out of the common course must have happened here. I told him that the bustle had been occasioned by the nuptials of Mademoiselle de Vildac. What? said he, raising his hands. Has Vildac a daughter? And is she married? May the God of heaven bless her and keep her heart pure, pure from the guilt of her progenitors. I am Vildac the grandfather of the young lady. I have a monster of a son, but no, I, his father, must not accuse him. I have no right to do so. You may easily conceive, my friend, that my astonishment at this confession was unbounded. I knew that the father of our Vildac had died and was buried twenty years ago, 
and now he suddenly appeared before me at midnight. I sprang from my seat, receded a few steps, fixed my eyes steadfastly on the spectre, and attempted to speak, but could not. The question, old man, are you really living or are you a spectre, quivered on my tongue, but I could not give it utterance. He read it, no doubt, in my looks. It is not a spectre, said he, that you see before you, but a man who has been entombed alive. By the God of heaven, I am the living dead grandfather of the bride whose nuptials you have been celebrating. The base cupidity of my cruel son and the hardness of his heart, which never knew the soft emotions of love and friendship, rendered him insensible to the voice of nature. He put me in chains that he might seize my possessions. He had one day visited a neighbouring gentleman, whose father had recently died. He found him amongst his tenants, receiving their rents and renewing their leases. This sight Vildac devoured with greedy eye, and it made the most baleful impression upon his heart, which had long cherished a wish to be master of the paternal estate. He now became more sullen and gloomy than ever. In about a fortnight, three men in masks burst one night into my chamber and dragged me half-naked to this tower. How Vildac could give out that I was dead I cannot tell, but from the tolling of bells and the sound of funeral hymns I inferred that it was my own obsequies they were performing. This idea filled my soul with mortal anguish. I solicited, as the greatest of favours, permission to speak to Vildac, but in vain. Those who, for these twenty years, have brought me bread and water to prolong my wretched life, probably consider me as a criminal who is condemned to die in this tower. This morning I took notice that the man who brought my allowance neglected to fasten the door securely. I waited anxiously for night, that I might avail myself of his carelessness. I must not escape, but the liberty of going a few steps farther than is usual is a great treat to the inmate of a dungeon. When I had first somewhat recovered from my astonishment, my first thought was to release the unfortunate man from this horrible confinement. In me, said I to him, the Almighty has sent you a deliverer. All are now fast asleep in the castle. Follow me. I will be your defender, your guide, your avenger. Instead of replying, he fell into a profound reverie. My long separation from all human society, he at length began, as if awakening from a dream, has produced a total revolution in my sentiments and ideas. Everything depends on imagination. I am now familiarised with all that renders my situation severe and terrible. Why should I exchange it for any other? The die is cast. I will terminate my wretched career in this tower. This melancholy meditation, this contempt of liberty, this most unexpected language, combined with other expressions, caused me to suspect some deeply hidden secret, and yet I knew not how to reconcile all these things. In short, the whole affair was to me quite incomprehensible. The old man, however, diminished my astonishment when he thus proceeded. In regard to the few days that I have yet to live, liberty has no charms for me. If my son is an atrocious villain, his innocent daughter has never done me any harm. Shall I pursue her into the arms of her husband with the disgrace of her family? No, rather would I press her to my heart and bedew her with my tears. But never, never must I, shall I behold her. Farewell, the day begins to dawn. I must return to my tomb. I opposed his intention and declared that I would not suffer him to go. Oppression, said I, has only impaired the faculties of your soul, but I will rouse your torpid spirits. Let us not now consider whether you ought to make yourself known. It will be time enough for that by and by. The first thing to be done is to quit this place of horror. My chateau, my influence and my purse are at your service. If you desire it, not a creature shall know who you are and Vildac's crime shall remain an inviolable secret. Can you now have any objection? I am thankful for your kindness. Would to God I could avail myself of it. But I cannot, must not go. Well then stay here, but I will acquaint the governor of the province with your melancholy situation, and we will then release you by force from the tyranny of your unnatural son. For heaven's sake, make not an improper use of my horrid secret. Leave a monster like me to perish here. I am unworthy of the liberty you offer. I have to atone for the most execrable, the most unnatural deed that villain ever perpetrated. Look here. With horror this accursed hand points to it. Look at the stains of blood. It is the blood of my father, murdered by me, me, infernal monster, that I might obtain the earlier possession of the paternal inheritance. Ha! 
The image of my expiring parent still haunts me. See, his blood-stained arms are still affectionately extended to snatch me from the brink of hell. Now, now they drop. Oh, father, father, thy avenger is despair. During this rhapsody, the old man sunk on the floor and tore the few silvery hairs that time had left on his aged head. His convulsions were frightful. He did not venture to look me in the face, while I, for my part, was absolutely petrified. After a pause of horror not to be described, we heard something stirring. It began also to be light. The old man, as if exhausted by the vehemence of his emotions, rose slowly from the floor. You are filled with just abhorrence of me, said he. Farewell. Forget, if you can, that you have ever seen me. I shall now return to my tomb, and I vow never to quit it more. I was utterly incapable of replying or of moving from the spot. The castle and every object in it now excited a horror that I could not conquer. I left it very early in the morning and am at this moment preparing to set out for another of my estates. I hope to God that I shall never more behold the avenging instrument employed by Providence, nor can I even bear to reside in his neighbourhood. <laughs>